Hey, what is going on, everybody out there? This is Jake James Lugo, Senior Editor here at TheCoalition.com, and welcome to a brand new episode of TK Spotlight, where I bring on phenomenal individuals from throughout the gaming industry and other parts of the internet all over the place, talk about their work, talk about the good that they've done for a lot of people through their craft. So this episode has been coming for a long time. This is something I've been dying to do for a very long time. I've been waiting for a while. I've been working hard, trying on the grind, finally got in touch with them, and finally we are able to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Everybody, Mr. Colin Moriarty, the, the pride of Long Island. He only does everything. Colin's last stand, uh, formerly co-founder of Kind of Funny Games. I mean, Jesus Christ. How's everything going, Colin? There's so many stuff that you've been doing. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I've, I've been around. I, I'm good, man. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for your years of supporting what I do. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. I'm, a, I'm an open book for you today. <laughs> this so, awesome. shoot. This is crazy, man. So again, like I, like I said before we started recording, this is surreal for me because, again, I've been a fan for years. I mean, I remember when you were back on back at IGN doing Podcast Beyond, followed you throughout Kind of Funny, and even now through Colin's Last Stand as you're on the grind posting up content online on the Internet for the variety of different stuff. But we're going to touch on a little bit of everything. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about everything, you know, your history of your stuff, a lot of your, your work, and, again, a lot of stuff of which you see yourself going towards in the future with some of the things that you want to do. But let's start a little bit with some old stuff, some classic stuff. I mean, I mean, you've been around doing content online, whether it's for gaming or for other stuff related to it or otherwise outside of it for a number of years. I believe I want to say and again, correct me if I'm wrong as far as the time frame you've been. You were at IGN for about eight years or so, correct? Close to a decade. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I, I started freelancing for IGN in 2002 and I did that full time until 2007. And then I became an editor in 2007 and I uh, left in 2014. So, yeah, I think it was. Seven years and like seven and a half years as an editor, like full time, and then f like four and a half or five years as a freelancer. And I was an intern in there too. So, but uh, so associated with the site, yeah, for yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So again, you've you've been you've been doing a lot of stuff online, been posting up a lot of content, whether it was guides, whether it was views, whether it was podcasts, whether it was videos, interviews, etc. Do you think that a lot of your views, whether it's on gaming or just online internet culture as a whole, has really changed since you really first started doing that back then? Even like right after you were a freelancer and then you started working at IGN, has has a lot of your perspective changed since then? Yeah, I think I mean I think it would for anyone doing it for that long. I think that the nature of the internet has really changed. And, um, you know, in that time, I mean, I remember, you know, writing for some random fan sites and then I wrote for game facts starting in 2000 for a few years. And, um, the internet when I was, uh, you know, in middle school and high school in the nineties and early two thousands is, is a radically different place than it is today. And so I think with that kind of comes, uh, you know, it's, it's today, it's much more open. Um, it, it was unheard of really to like be a face and a person in a place, you know, like people right now in 2017, I'm Colin Moriarty. I, I live in Santa Monica, California. Um, I do all these things. But back in the day, like those were like tightly kept secrets. You know, a lot of true. You know, if your parents, if your parents, I remember my parents being aghast that I had like friends online, and that's like a totally casual thing now. People <laughs> are using Tinder, Tinder to sleep with people on you know that they meet online. So it's like that. With, with that change, I think has come more candor. Um, and obviously, you know, I was 18 when I started at IGN, and I'm 32 now. So, or no, I'm actually 33. I just, I just turned 33. I gotta get used to that. So, um, yeah, you had your birthday not so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Which I try to keep, try to keep relatively silent, but you know, Aaron kind of, you know, blew it up she a little blew bit, it up. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, so yeah, obviously over time things change. And so my opinions have changed as well, uh, in terms of literally everything. So yes. Yeah, so I, I'm curious to know, again, when you, back then, like when you were really on the ground, when you were really trying to work hard and, and make an impact in the industry, do you feel like there's a lot of different trials and tribulations or things that you had to kind of overcome back then as opposed to what people have now? Because obviously, like you said, it's a different ball game now and a different uh, playing field for a lot of people trying to either break into the gaming industry or any other respective industry now that we have a lot of stuff like social media. We have a lot of different facets of Internet culture that really impact and, or influence a lot of the careers or just you know, the overall portfolio and the body of work that people have. I mean, was it really, do you notice like certain things that like you maybe you had to deal with back then that maybe some people don't have to deal with now or vice versa? Sure. Uh, I, I think in some way, like it's a coin flip, right? Like back in the day, it was way harder to get noticed to, um, you know, like when I was writing facts on game facts, it really could have been any of us, any of the talented writers there, which is, it was me that got noticed. It was just a luck thing and, and a skill thing for sure. I mean, I was good at it, but um, you know, there were people that were just as good, if not better than me that, that didn't get noticed and didn't do it. I also wasn't really intending when IGN got in touch with me to ever do this full time. I mean, I was, I was, uh, about to start at Northeastern for history and, um, I just had some other things in mind. 
and it kind of like kind of hijacked my life for like a decade. <laughs> um, but but uh, so I, it's a trade off. It was it was um, the barrier to entry was way higher back then, but there were way few pe- fewer people doing it, and there were more reasonable ways to get in. I mean, the the way I, I you know people have asked me about like you know how do I become a game journalist or how do I write about games, and I'm like you really today you don't. I mean like I. I wouldn't recommend anyone go down that path because it's so rare these days and there's so much competition in that world and that world is kind of dying um, in its own way that now you have this, like you said, a really accessible YouTube, Twitch, podcasts, social media. So it's way easier to do. The barrier to entry is way lower, um, but there's way more competition. And there's also nowhere for you to really go except for to create your own independent ventures, which a lot of people are doing, which I have done. And, um, so it's just a different world. You know what I mean? It's, it's easier to get out there. I, I would say it's easier to, 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 be a name today, but it might be harder to get like, you know, the days of, um, of me getting a million views on something like I did at IGN are, they're gone. Those days are gone, you know? Um, yeah. so, so the whole landscape has just changed. And I think that that with that, with, with that changing landscape comes different expectations of how you do the work and how you grind, but it was a very hard grind. I stuck with it. And um, it worked out great. And I love IGN for what they allowed me to do. So kind of going off shooting off of that, I mean, one of the biggest things I remember, you know, being a fan of you for so many years and listening to Podcast Beyond, because I feel to me, I'll always feel like Podcast Beyond is yours and Greg's show. Like, because that's what that's what I grew up on, like listening to back in the day a lot. And one of the things I remember you guys talking about, it, I forgot which episode it was, but you had some sort of guest on there. I believe it was a musical guest at some point where you were talking about being genuine. You were talking about how you were uh, how a lot of the outside influences, whether it was online through social media or other places, not dictating which direction that you go. And I always thought that was very interesting because not a lot of people were talking about that type of stuff at the time, like whether it was on podcasts or videos or even in editorials. I, I believe, I, I, again, I can't remember verbatim what exactly you said, but you had t- were talking about uh, being a game journalist or being someone that works in games media, but not having to actually play everything, not having to actually, you know, with your own personal preferences, be a fan of everything or just uh, dedicate yourself to playing the entire landscape, but still having your own personal preferences while still understanding while everything else is there. I mean, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, I think that um, there's this misconception in games media, and I think even amongst, like, kind of new, you know, greenhorns, as it were, in games media, that they have to be, like, up on everything, (laughs) that they have to, yeah, the noobs, exactly, that they have to, like, kind of play everything and, 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 uh, you know, kind of be up on everything. And I'm like, that's just not, that's not reasonable. Um, and it's not reasonable to kind of project this fake aura about what you do and what you know, um, just to impress people. Like you, you, you should be honest with your, with your audience about what you, what your preferences are. So I was always honest. I was like, I was a Nintendo fan for a really long time. And now I'm a PlayStation fan and I still respect Nintendo and I like shooters and role-playing games. If you ask me about, um, you know, a, a, a real time strategy game on PC. I'm not going to have any idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> so my so my whole thing was like, I know PlayStation, and I still feel this way. I know PlayStation better than pretty much anyone that that covers that covers that, and I and I stand by that, um, like 100. percent But um, and I would say that I could walk away for a long time and probably still hold that title. Why? Because people don't specialize the way Greg and I did um, in these things anymore, and feel like they have to be platform agnostic. Um, and so when, so I don't know much about the Xbox ecosystem, but I, I don't have time to know much about the Xbox ecosystem. True. In other words, it's okay to, to know something really well, as opposed to trying to be like a Renaissance man and be like, well, yeah, I, I dabbled a little bit with this and I dabbled a little bit with that, but I'm like, I don't dabble with that at all. I, I don't dabble with this either. I jump into this. Um, and, uh, I know this. And so that's where, you know, my heart was. And I felt like it was always really important to be honest with the audience about that, that, you know, you know what you get. And I don't really have a baseline for what we were doing. I, people ask, you know, with podcasts beyond, like, what, what were your inspirations? And I'm like, I don't know. I, like, I, I don't, I've never <laughs> listened to a gaming podcast in my life. You know? Yeah. When I say, when I say I've never listened to a gaming podcast in my life, I've never listened to a gaming podcast in my life to this day. <laughs> like, I don't, there's not Literally. like a, a gaming podcast. I said, yeah, like unless I was on it or someone was like, you should check this out for a news story. I, I don't subscribe to anything. I don't even know what anyone else is doing. We were just doing what we thought was right, like what we thought our show should be with no influence other than the influence that was in our brains, that the things that we wanted to say and what we wanted to do. So we were trying not to, uh, to appease or please anyone except for the audience that knew exactly who we were. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that it, it to me, it's it's um, candor is like the the, the secret <laughs> like the secret ingredient that really shouldn't be secret at all to any successful podcast or any successful endeavor. Um, and you can, can't you smell bullshit a mile away? 
you know, like, like, I I don't think, I don't think anyone ever, you can say a lot of things about me and I know some of them aren't nice, but the, but I don't think anyone ever accused me of bullshitting them. Oh, definitely. So I'm really proud of that. (laughs) I mean, definitely. As someone has watched almost, if not just about everything that you've probably put out again, whether it was podcast beyond or otherwise, uh, I I can confirm that you definitely do not bullshit. If anything, you're very blunt in a lot of the stuff that you put out there. And I think it was good for the audience, but to play a little devil's advocate, do you feel like because you guys, you Greg and everybody else that was on podcast beyond the were connoisseurs or pretty much, you know, pretty much highly but you know very very good experts in the playstation ecosystem do you guys feel like or at least do you feel like that that limited you a little bit at, at the time when you were at ign throughout all those years because maybe you couldn't apply that to like other aspects and other stuff i mean outside of just not having enough time yeah i think it, i think there was probably a downside to it I, I i don't um you know there's only there's a finite amount of time in the day right so there are games that i wish i got into on other platforms or games that i kind of cut out of out of you know cut time out for I always use Shadow Complex as a really great example, which was an Xbox 360 game for a long time um, before it came to other platforms, and I love that game. It's one of my favorite games of that generation. That's not that wasn't on PS3. I but, remember you talking about it back yeah. on podcast beyond. Yeah, I loved it, and and um, you know there are certainly games that I wasn't exposed to because they weren't on the platforms that I covered. But I was never, you know, I always tried to like paint the picture for people that because you love something or you're into something doesn't mean you're a fanboy. Um, I argued that no one was harder on PlayStation than I, I was, and Definitely. <laughs> um, that, and that like that like I don't know how. And that's like where the whole fanboy thing comes in, and like why I'm so glad that I'm not in the gaming industry anymore because it's just so tiring to like argue about these toys basically um, with people that like don't want to like be rational about things. It's like an endless and argument. And to me, I was, yeah, it's and it's just stupid. Like I mean, it's meaningless, you know. And and at the end of the day, like it's fun, but like why are we? Why do we even care? You know, like it's it's like what do you? It's cool that we care about games, but why do you care? Why are you so offended by this other person's opinion on games? It makes no sense. And and to me, uh, I tried to simply kind of hone my craft, be good and reliable for the audience that we we had, and understand that like I could either really know something very well, better than I think again anyone any one of my peers or contemporaries knew it, or I could know it. I can know these these other things as well, or worse than other people did, and um, kind of be a generalist. And I look at it like a good example is like I love bourbon, right? Bourbon yeah. is just one kind of whiskey and whiskey is just one kind of liquor. And if you asked me anything about gin or you asked me anything about vodka or if you even asked me anything about another kind of whiskey like scotch, I would know next to nothing compared to how deeply I know bourbon. So am I more useful to, to, to someone as someone who knows something very well or am I more useful as someone, to, you know, as someone who knows games or knows – Flickers or whatever the case might be in just kind of a general way. I can kind of point you in the right direction. What, what's more useful for you? I always thought that I was more useful for the audience as being an authoritative voice on that platform. And um, so even though there was certainly, of course, there's downside to that. I think that the upside was tremendous. And I think that's why P, you know, uh, Podcast Beyond was so big. And I think that that's why it kind of funny when we started PS I Love You, it was huge. It was the biggest PlayStation exactly. podcast in the world on iTunes without an episode. People were just subscribing to it. Because we were we we announced it. I mean that's a that's a big deal. And I know that if I ever went back into the PlayStation world again, I would have that kind of audience again because they trust me. Because they know you know? they so, know that you know exactly what you're talking about. Again, like you said, authoritative figure and exactly how you want to express yourself. Right. It's like there's only there's only so much time. Like I, I understand PC gaming a little bit. I understand Xbox gaming. I know Nintendo history very well. But you know, are you going to ask me for an Xbox opinion? I don't think so. And that's okay. <laughs> there's other guys. Ryan McCaffrey knows Xbox. Like I know Definitely. PlayStation. Go ask him. Definitely. You know? so, <laughs> Ryan McCaffrey yeah. definitely knows about the most about the Xbox ecosystem. Like he's like the equivalent of what you guys were to PlayStation. And then on, on the side of that, the Nintendo side of that, I would say either Sam Claiborne or Per Snyder is like the equivalent of that for the Nintendo ecosystem. It's like guys. Have yeah, like Pear, yeah, yeah. Pear, Pear knows. I think Altano even has a great knowledge of that. And the beauty, the beauty of it is that you mix and match all of these different personalities and these people. Who do you trust? Who do you not? You know, if you know, I don't play a lot of games that people like. I don't, you know, and so maybe you, maybe my opinions mean nothing to you. But that's okay, you know. It, it doesn't mean exactly. that I'm doing anything wrong, and it doesn't mean that you're wrong either. It's just about taste. That's it. I think it's also that you get exposed to a lot of different opinions, which I think is always good, especially when you want to try to be well informed. So you want to get a general idea of something or an understanding of it. I think that's always good, especially when you have it coming from different facets or different spectrums here and there. But you know something? You mentioned bourbon. You mentioned whiskey. This is a perfect segue to the next thing that I want to kind of transition to, especially moving on from IGN over to Kind of Funny, because I if I don't know if you remember. Okay, it was a while back. It was towards your last year, and I want to say your last few months at IGN when you went to New York Comic Con. That was the first time I think I really met you in person. 
I remember, not only just at the podcast beyond panel, but at that, uh, was it the IGN, like some, some like Skyloft party that there was had. There. Yeah. I remember, I remember that party because my mom and my brother were there. That's why exactly. I remember that. Yeah. I, I rem- yeah. So after that party, okay, at least it's not so much about the party, but afterwards, everybody had went to First on First Avenue, which is a bar. For anybody that doesn't know, that's a, First on First Avenue is a bar in New York City that's over in First on First Avenue, literally. And a whole bunch of people went there. You went there, Greg, uh, I believe, uh, what is it, uh, Mike Aransky went, uh, Marty Sleva, and a couple people from the Walking Dead uh, voice cast at the time. And that was the first time where I really got to sit down and interact, not just with you, but with everybody else there. And one of the things that really stuck out to me at the time was not only the welcome attitude and you know just like everybody's like yo hey what's up we saw you there come come hang out have some fun you get you gave me my first whiskey my first old-fashioned i'll never forget that 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 was like just totally out of random you were just like here i was like oh okay that's cool but to really bring the point home and tie it all together it's this it's the the type of attitude and the way that you conduct yourself which i always thought was interesting that we never saw or at least i never saw from a lot of other personalities that from either side whether it was from the games media or even from the internet world you know like youtube and content creation and stuff i mean tell me a little bit about that was that like you know that attitude and the way that you come off with people is that something that you consciously you know try to you know try to do whenever you're around others whether it's friends or family or just other individuals or is that just something that just came natural yeah, I think that I have to I have to say that there's got to be a level of consciousness about, um, you know, the way you conduct yourself around other people and also understanding that these people that want to just shake your hand or say hello or take a picture, um, they they're fans that they're the reason that you're able to that I'm able to do what I do um, without you, without people like you, thousands and tens of thousands and over time, hundreds of thousands of people like you, I'd be nothing in this world. And so I've, you know, I've had interactions with quote unquote famous people that have been very positive and I've had them where they've been really negative, you know, and they change the, the way you look at them. And I'd never wanted someone to meet me and think that and walk away and be like, wow, that guy fucking sucked, you know? Yeah. And that ruined, that ruined my opinion. But, but that's not an active kind of thing that I do. Like, I know that I have this brash persona and I'm, I'm, I'm very, you're a New Yorker, aren't you? Yeah, of course. Or, I, I grew up in Westchester. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So you understand, like that. The way I am when people are like, "Wow, you're very brash and you're very blunt." I'm like, "This is kind of the way that's normal." The, my people are <laughs> like, I never, I, I, no one ever told me that I was. I never even heard anyone use the word brash in regard to me or blunt in regard to me until I moved to California. Ever, mm. you know, when, when I was 23 years old. So it's, so that's just the way I am. But but I feel like I'm a warm person and I feel like I'm a kind person and I I don't have to try to be that way. I am that way. And, uh, so I'm glad that people kind of get that insight into me like that. I'm, you know, when we're talking about things, when things are getting heated, when we're passionate, that's one thing. But, you know, if you, people stop me on the street still to this day, people recognize me in restaurants or whatever the case might be. And I'm always happy to shake a hand and I'm always happy to say hello, you know, and give you a little bit of time because you've given me, God, how you were saying you listen to all these episodes of podcast beyond and PS, I love you and kind of funny. I mean, that's, that's like, that could potentially be like thousands of hours of your life. You know? <laughs> and so, I'm, and, and so I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to be like, up, you know, be, you know, fronting and be like, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm too busy for you. Eh, I, that's just, that's not who I am. So I'm, I'm happy to be that way. And I'm glad that that was a good memory for you. Yeah. Again, I'll never forget that. I mean, it was cool, obviously meeting you, hanging out, drinking whiskey with everybody, even just meeting Greg there. That was, I believe that was the second time I met Greg in person. Cause I met, I think the first time I met him was at E3 and I think I didn't meet you at E3 until the second year I went to my second E3 when I was covering it and stuff. And that was cool too. Cause I think, I think at the time I, you were just like working on some stuff and I just walked, randomly went up to you and said, hello. And you were like, Hey, what's going on? Like that. And to go off your point, you weren't like, so like, Oh, to get away from me. Cause you know how things get at E3. Everybody's like losing their minds. Everybody's going crazy. Everybody's doing a million things at once and within a given minute and stuff. And I always thought that that was cool because I also noticed that that same type of attitude and the way that you conducted yourself amongst with other people carried over into Kind of Funny. And I think it got even better and was even more magnified when you were at Kind of Funny when you guys finally co-founded that company and stuff. I want to know out of curiosity when, when you guys finally left IGN and within that first like I want to say maybe a couple months or so was there ever a moment that you felt like you know where the things weren't going right or things were just kind of going off the rails or not falling into place as much as you probably wanted it to be you know whether it's financially wise or even just the way that the reception from some of the, from the viewers and stuff did you ever think that maybe at some point that things weren't going to work out and maybe you have to course correct yeah i think well i think we just had no idea what was going to happen <laughs> you know like it was it's funny you bring up that 2014 comic-con because that was when 
we had decided we were going to leave. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and um, and we kind of we've told that story since then, but we never. Um, but it was that it was mid October when we when we when we the, internally the four of us decided, and and right after that we went to talk to our bosses, and then no one knew. somehow that secret was kept in the industry until January, which was really great. Um, but um, even in, you know at IGN we didn't tell anyone until December except for our bosses. So it was you know we. We had no idea. I was really scared, you know. Um, you know, games journalists don't make a lot of money, and Greg and I were in a unique position where we were both making way more than the normal person in that industry did. And um, you know, I, I, you know, editors get hired at like you know in San Francisco, which is you know unfathomable and unconscionable at forty thousand dollars or forty five thousand dollars a year. I was making way more than that at IGN, and um, you know, and I knew a lot of people below me that were working on my team or that were working on our team where were you know would have killed for my, you know, for being senior editor of IGN and for walking away from sure. a lot of money. Um, and, and actually walking away from, you know, they, they offered me a lot of things to stay, you know, a lot more than I was making and a lot, a cool, you know, a better position. And I, I, I walked away from that and part of me felt so presumptuous, you know, like, who are you to think that you can just walk away from this and succeed? There's a lot of pride to You it. don't have what it, I think there was, and I think that it was a lot of, um, there was a lot of, the four of us were really kind of convincing each other without anyone really knowing any better than the other person up. that this was going <laughs> to, yeah, that, that, that it would work. And I think Greg was obviously the most gung-ho. Um, and I think I was the least gung-ho. And um, there was a loyalty a a aspect to it too. You know, I owed a lot. You know, I was at IGN and related to IGN way longer than those other guys. And so, um, you know, there was a loyalty factor. I, I turned down a lot of things to go do other things over time because I didn't want to leave IGN. And yeah. so... Um, so yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea what it was, how it was going to work. Did I did I real did I think that it was going to work out the way that it worked out? And that you know that the golden era, kind of funny to me, will always be 2015. And yeah. um, and did I think it was going to be as fun as it was? Did I think we were going to be as successful as we were? All that? No, I had no I had no idea whatsoever that that was going to happen. So it's um you know it was an exciting time, but it was an uncertain time. But you know I I prepared. I saved money and and had you know freelance lined up in case I needed it and. You know, but it all worked out. It all worked out great. So let me ask you, do you feel like that stress or at least that anxiety or that fear, with, you know, about things like not knowing how things are going to work out or even things worried about things going badly and stuff, did that carry over into kind of funny even during that golden year of 2015 to 2016? Yeah, we, we, we tried to work. We tried to leave nothing out on the field, right? Like we took every opportunity that came towards us, which which started to change the company materially. And that was kind of one of the reasons why I wasn't happy with it anymore. But we... We ended, you know, we, we took every opportunity. We tried to build a, a, a nice bank account to be able to pay ourselves, to be able to pay freelancers, to kind of bring ourselves the security that we needed um, and wanted in order to grow, in order to like live our lives. San Francisco is not a cheap place. I'm not, you know, 18 Super or 19 expensive. years old anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's outrageous. I mean, my I always tell people that my three bedroom apartment in San Francisco, which I got during the recession, was rent controlled and it was about three grand a month, which is a steal. You know, and it, I think when I left, um, you know, they, they must have raised it to at least 55, if not oh, higher, wow. you know, so it's, it's a really expensive place to live. And um, you, you just need some security in that. And, and you also, you know, there's a pride. I like to win. There is a pride to it, you know, and I want to win. I, with Podcast Beyond, I didn't do Podcast Beyond to be the second or third best video game podcast. I did it to be the best video game podcast. When I ran IGN PlayStation, I didn't want it to just be another PlayStation channel. I wanted it to be the best destination for PlayStation on the internet. And so with Kind of Funny and with P.S. I Love You and all these things and Colin was right, I wanted it to be the best. And, you know, I think we had a really good time, a moment in time where everything was sinking and everything was awesome. And um, a lot of that came from from calibrating on a day to day or week to week basis. And um, we did. So, yeah, of course, like uh, we the. the Everything changed constantly, and I'm sure still is for them today. I, I agree. Again, I remember watching all that stuff. Everything as it happens, you know, as an observer on the outside looking in, it was a cool time to be a fan because, again, you guys were really kicking ass a lot. Like every single day almost throughout the entire week, almost 365 minus. I think you guys took used to take breaks during the holidays, like for Christmas and stuff. But uh, one of the things I want to know is that was there any sort of like shift in mentality or shift in like perspective that you had to do once you were already in, in, in the trench? is with kind of funny and things were already moving and like you were producing or at least you know putting up all these different shows you were doing the different daily shows eventually was it not kind of funny games daily but um was it colin greg live at one point yeah you, yeah there, was, there yeah. was a lot of different stuff was there like a, a a mental shift that you had to do in order to kind of you know keep things going keep things moving and keep things winning yes i think well i think i think one of the major things that um that i had to do and to kind of adjust with was like letting go of 
this this singular vision that I had in my own mind of what we were supposed to be doing and kind of be a little more collaborative um, in that regard. And so, you know, it seemed like it was going, and, and I think Greg had told the story that it seemed like it was going to be easier than it ended up being, right? Like the, we, we, we didn't think that it was going to be, we thought it would be as hard as what we did at IGN. And I think that people underestimate how hard it is to produce content. And I think a lot of people produce amateur content that's just not very good. And they learn very quickly how hard it actually is to be authoritative, to, to be good on camera, to be good in front of a microphone. So there's skill there. But we thought we would be able to do the morning show, do these podcasts, do these Let's Plays and have free time and actually like explore things in our lives. And what we found out was that it was the exact opposite. Um, I had never worked more in my life than I did, you know, in those beginning times of kind of funny with with rare exception until I founded Collins Last Stand. And then I, I, I you know, 60 hour week is a, is a nice short week for me now. Mm. So um, so it's again, cal- constant calibration, constant changing, constant adaptation and evolution of the product that I think comes along with creating online content as you see what people like and what people don't, that kind of feedback. I had no, when I, when I came up with the idea for Collins, uh, or for, uh, Colin and Greg live, I had no idea it was going to be as silly and, and, and ridiculous as it ended up being. And, um, uh, and that, that's what people wanted. That, that was the other crazy thing. Right. And, uh, when we, um, did the let's plays, we thought we would do a let's play every day and that would be easy, but there was no reason to do them every day. So you just, you, your assumptions get checked in the real world. Was, was there ever a moment like when you saw like people were really reacting to something like very well and you just thought to yourself like, what the hell is the matter with people? Like, why would we even bother doing this? But yet there's so many people watching these videos, so many people commenting on this stuff, so many people giving you positive reinforcement, positive feedback. And you were just like, why the hell is this like this? This is like so completely counterproductive here. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of it is just a lot of what we learned was counterintuitive based on the fact that at least for me that I had no baseline for, you know, for being such a veteran in the gaming industry and for just doing whatever I wanted to do for all those years, I had no idea what other people were doing. So there was nothing to compare it against. So when I was, so when we stopped doing podcasts beyond, um, you know, we'd freelance for a little while to do that. And then we stopped doing it. It was, uh, I was, I was shocked. I mean, it was heartening, but I was shocked. I was like, why do people miss us doing this so much? There's a million video game podcasts, right? And then when we came back into the PS, I love you. Everyone found a home again. And, it made me realize I'm like, wow, like there, this, this stuff means something to people and the things that you think don't mean anything to people are the things that you kind of just are flipping about can be the most important thing of a person's life, something that they really look forward to. And so, yeah, I, I think that all wrapped up in this, this idea of, of understanding and knowing what you're doing is a whole lot of having no idea what you're doing, you know, and, and that, and, and that, and that form of letting go, I think is a really powerful and humbling kind of situation. You know what I think it is also? I kind of relate it to music. Like, if you have, like, a favorite song that's a classic, that's, like, part of, like, an OG album, and all of a sudden, like, the same artist starts putting out, like, a bunch of new stuff, and it just doesn't have that same spark, but then all of a sudden in the club, that one track that you know, like, hits that sweet spot, I kind of relate it to that. It almost has that same reactive effect, that same chemistry that you guys have with Podcasts Beyond, that going into PS I Love You XOXO, and everybody just felt, reacted the same way, and just felt like things just felt right with that, as opposed to everything well, else that was going on. Well, I feel like that's a common theme and it's something I still hear to this day. I don't know that, you know, I want to speak for Greg, but I, I, I feel like Greg and I in that, in the gaming world will never do anything that's, that reaches as many people or that resonates with as many people as what we did with podcast beyond and with PS. I love you. And I accept that, you know, that's fine. I'm sure Greg probably accepts that too, that like nothing, no podcast, nothing will ever resonate like the way we, when we got together and did it right, you know? And that's cool. It doesn't mean it has to last forever, but it's nice that it's that, cool exists, that it's yours. You know? It's cool that you, it's your something that you guys directly influence and directly create and it's directly, directly responsible for, for a lot of people out there. Yeah, I, I think that's cool. And I think it's great that, that it resonates. And I hope that people, you know, carry that with them that it's, you know, I, I, we're, ne- we're never going to do a show together again, but it's, it's, but it does, you know, it, it's, it's there. There's hundreds of episodes for you, you know, not that the timeliness of them doesn't, you know, kind of negates their usefulness, but um, you know, there, it's cool that that exists and it's, I, I find it nice that people feel that way. I don't find it when people are like, man, I really miss you in gaming. I really miss you doing stuff with Greg. I really miss you podcasting about PlayStation. I don't take that as an insult. You know, I take that as like, wow, I really, a high compliment. I really stuck with this person. It's a very high compliment. It's one of the highest compliments ever. And I'm sure Greg feels the same way that, you know, even though he endeavors in the gaming industry to this day and does his, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure exactly what they're doing, but you know, their, their new shows and stuff like that, that they're probably not going to resonate nearly as much as beyond or PS. I love you did with anyone. And that's, that's okay. 
you know, because that was a place and time kind of situation. And I think that that's nice. That's that's our bond with the audience and our, with each other. And I think that that's great. I hope it. I hope. It, I hope it rings through the, the ages, as it were. <laughs> I think it will because, at least for someone like me, and again, you know, not speaking for anybody else, but ju- just through my own personal experience, I feel like a lot of the stuff that you guys talked about and the way you guys went about it, and I think the thought process and, and the way that you handled, whether it was breaking news, even like crazy stuff like the PSN outage and stuff, there are always, I feel like, lessons and certain things that people could get out of listening to those past podcasts. Because I remember even just like preparing just for this one-on-one, I went back and I listened to a few of the episodes and stuff, and it's just, it, it, it has those things where it's like you feel like you got something out of it some food for thought or something whether it was an important lesson or just a new perspective on something back then that i feel like people are always going to go back to those same episodes whether it's beyond or uh ps i love you and are going to get something out of it way into the future even way past even to when you guys are in your old age i hope so that would be awesome and i i feel like you know um that's that's great you know, like I, 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 I've had time more recently to reflect on the past and to like kind of like be in the moment and, and you know, think about what's happened and what's gone on and what the future might hold and yeah, and I, I, I feel like it's, I feel like that that's just, that's just all positive for me. That's just all that's all gravy. Like, uh, but like I said before, like yeah, like I may I might never have the reach or the popularity that I did when I had when I did Beyond and P.S. I Love You and Greg might not either, but that doesn't mean that what we're doing now doesn't resonate with a different audience for different reasons and all that kind of stuff. But we still, we'll always have that bond. Even if he and I never speak again. Um, I like that we've left that imprint on people and it means a lot. I think that we were one of the most dynamic duos in, in, in games media history. I think a lot of people agree. And, um, I can't I, I, with that. it's, it's, a, it's an honor. It's an honor that, that it probably will not be replicated anytime soon. And that's cool. That's yeah. great. But it's, it's like, it's like the Beatles, right? Like not that I'm comparing us, to the Beatles in a way, but I guess I am literally, I guess I, I guess I literally am comparing us to the Beatles, but just like any, any great band that had this great run and then disappeared, you know, definitely. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, but, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, like I said, I, I think it, it's a good word to say it's timeless. And I think a lot of those episodes, again, 300 plus episodes practically of Podcast Beyond, that it, to, to a lot of people are, are timeless. And and I think it, it's cool. And it's going to be interesting, you know, years from now when a new generation goes and discovers stuff like that, whether they're trying to get into the games industry or if, even if they're just into gaming and just want more dope stuff to listen to. It's going to be like going back to like those old classic like rap albums that a lot of people uh, don't know about and then just all of a sudden rediscovering those artists again. And I, I kind of like see the parallels there for, for this. But now I think it, it, here's a good transition. I think obviously we have to talk about it. We have to address it in some form or fashion. Obviously, when you made the jump from kind of funny to what you're doing now with Colin's Last Stand, um, I think the story has been told many times. It's been mentioned and all the details about it, they're out there. And I don't want to focus on that. One of the things that I do feel is important and I don't really feel a lot of people really touch on a lot was that I feel like when you left the games industry and and obviously you did it on your own accord and everything else that happened along with it, I feel like the game industry lost something special. And and the reason being is because even for someone like me as a fan of yours, okay, removing myself from whatever kind of like bias, I guess you could say for me having that as a fan, I feel like there isn't any other people that I know of with maybe the exception of Greg to some extent that, that really gives that, that kind of, you know, the, the quote-unquote real talk or, or, or that perspective that you used to give in a lot of the stuff that you do. Like, when I used to listen to Podcast Beyond, when I used to listen to uh, PS I Love You XOXO, and even when I would watch Colin and Greg live, or even Colin was right uh, towards the end of your run on Kind of Funny, I, I always felt like, you know, when you did something and you were talking about something, whether it was a subject you were passionate about or the news, you were giving something back to people that was food for thought. You wanted them to walk away with something that was really important. And I don't feel like we have that anymore in the games industry. I mean... Granted, obviously, you went through all that stuff when, when you left and whatnot. Tell, tell me a little bit about that, or at least, you know, some, some of your thoughts about that. Well, I, every day, without fail, someone asked me to come back, right? And like, Please, Colin, come I, back. <laughs> That's what they do. And, you know, it's always an option. Like, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. But, and, and I don't mean the kind of funny. I'm never going back to kind of funny. But, I mean, in terms of the gaming, the gaming industry, right? And, um, it, again, it, it's similar to what I was talking about with Beyond and with PS I Love You and kind of the things that Greg and I did, which resonated above all this other stuff. It's it's an honor that people feel that way about me, and and I, I feel like I I feel like the I, if if I can if I can be so bold as to talk about what I think the lost piece of the narrative is here is that, you know, I could have left and started a gaming thing and been way bigger and made way more money, and I intentionally didn't do that, and I think it's a great honor to me. 
um, and I take it as a great honor, that I just made this totally random left turn out of nowhere and did something totally different in a totally different sphere and took a bunch of people with me. And I think that that's, a, that's, that's so cool. Like, that's not something that a lot of people can do. And um, I didn't know that I was going to be able to do it. And I certainly didn't think I was going to be able to do it to this level. Um, like, I've told people many times now, like, my, my, my wildest expectation was that after a year of Collins Last Stand, I might have a thousand patrons, right? And, yeah. um, and then I wanted to just pursue this idea of doing something different. That if I was going to get bullshit online and I was going to get grief online and I had to deal with stuff, maybe it should be about something that mattered. If I was going to, like, and I'm not saying games don't matter. What I'm saying is that at the end of the day, they hold no weight in terms of society. They hold no weight in terms of the real world. They're a hobby and they're, and they're an art and they're awesome. And I love games. Um, but to me, I was like, there's an opportunity cost here. I'm getting beaten up about the way I feel about PlayStation, what I said about this or that. Like, who cares? If I'm going to take heat from someone, then maybe I should say something that means something. And um, that was like the whole idea behind Colin's Last Stand was to not like to not go do games again, but to also not go down like the anti SJW thing. Like I don't use those terms. I don't use the term snowflake or cuck or any of these terms that people throw around to try to be a little more positive. When... <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like these kind of not productive things and instead just do something political and historical and follow my heart. Like I said earlier to you, like the IGN's inclusion in my life when I was 18 was a great disruption of my life in a great way, but it was a huge disruption. Like I was, I was, you know, uh, going to college or about to start college when, when IGN, um, got in touch with me. I went through college and graduated and then they offered me a job. And at that time I was about to start grad school. So the, even when I was a freelancer at IGN, it was just a means to an end for me to get my PhD. And, um, you know, everything's different now. And for me to do Collins last stand, I was like, well, I should really reconnect with what I love the most. And I love video games. I love them. I've been playing games on a pretty much daily basis for 30 years of my life, but I really love history and I really love politics. And so it just seemed like the right move for me. And I took great pride in building a small audience. I just had this small little sliver of the internet. It's nothing impressive um, where people want to hear what I have to say. And I'm thankful for that. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, what we were saying earlier about how like the days of these, you know, of founding a new website for games, they're done. No one's finding a new gaming website. Now people have their little corners of the internet where they relate to people. And I just have my little corner of the internet. And I'm totally happy with that, you know? And um, it worked out better than I could have imagined. I, I financially all of those other kind of things. It's been an amazing blessing in my life, but um, that was never the intention. If the intention was to like maximize money, I would have stayed it kind of funny or I would have um, founded my own gaming thing and, and, and done even more. But I, I wanted to follow my heart. And uh, that's an important thing that I, I encourage people to do sooner or later is to like make a bold move and see what happens. And I, for some reason, keep putting chips on the table and for some reason I keep winning. Um, and I know that that won't, I know that that won't last forever, which is why I'm probably not going to do it again. Um, but you know, I'm thankful that I, I was able to win this many times in some sort of way to have a life for myself and to, and to touch other people's lives. And I hope that I've been a positive force in these people's lives. I agree. I, I think you have. And, and the cool thing is, you know, transitioning to Colin's last stand, uh, you, you take that same approach and that same thought process and the same handle and care whenever you discuss different topics or you have conversations with people that you did with games. And again, that you, uh, uh, what is it, uh, exercise during those years at Podcast Beyond and kind of funny and stuff <laughs> that you, you apply it to other issues. And I think much more important, uh, interesting issues and, and topics that I feel like a lot of people don't really explore or at least are ill-informed about. Like myself, as an example, I'm very politically ill-informed and a lot of it, part of it is my fault, but also because I'm not exposed to that type of stuff as much as I think I should be at some point. But you, you're watching your videos or watching your po or listen to your podcast and watching you discuss different stuff like what's going on in politics right now, what happened with the election not too long ago, what's going on now with the country and stuff like that, I feel is very good because it still has that same approach and that same level and quality and care, like, uh, but uh, as apply, applied to like something completely different. Uh, what what is the one thing that you feel like you know now talking about politics talking about other issues and other subjects outside of games that you feel like is more the 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 better more bigger more important aspect that people are going to get out of it well i think you know what i want people to realize is that you know a good touchstone to this is like whenever i bring up games on twitter which i've been doing more recently i'm reminded about how much i hate the gaming industry and the reason i say that is because it's like, oh, you're a fanboy, or like, what about this or that? Like, when I, I you, you, like, it's, it, it reminded me of how, like, how, why I left, like, or one of the reasons why I wanted to get out of there to begin with. And 
that said, there's like a lot of parallels to politics, right? Like there's a lot of fanboyism with parties and with ideas and, and there's not a lot of open mindedness. And all I want people to like take away from what I do, I don't care if they like me or not. I don't care if they agree with me or not. I don't care if they subscribe or support me on Patreon. All I want is for them to like walk away being like, wow, you don't have to be an ideologue. Um, you can have your own ideas, your own solutions. They can have this weird amalgamation of ideas and solutions that don't necessarily uh, purport to uh, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. Uh, you know, I always get, I always think it's funny when someone's like, Colin's a libertarian, or Colin's a conservative, or Colin's a liberal, or Colin's... I'm like, I don't think you can really peg me down that much. And so all I want people to walk away from it, with this is like, just keep an open mind, explore interesting ideas. There's no shame in not... Know, I, there's like a million things that I don't know about politics, just, which I think is the case even for the most embedded political operative. But it's, the, it's about keeping an open mind, being intellectually curious... And kind of utilizing some of that free time you have in your life, not necessarily to play a game, but you can do that. And that's fun. I do that too. But maybe pick up a book. Maybe go to the library. Maybe, you know, read the newspaper or watch an interview or watch a debate. Um, you know, I, I intentionally uh, carve out time in my life now to read, um, which I, I've always been a voracious reader, but I, I, I'm reading the way I haven't read in years and years. Really? And really? yeah, like since college, probably when I read. And, um, a lot of that comes from the fact that like, I only play video games for five or 10 hours a week instead of 40, you know, and that I only, you know, try to, you know, limit my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to intentionally limit my time playing games, but what I'm saying is that like, I'll pick up a game and play for an hour or two a night and then put it down and then go take a bath and read. I'm reading the Federalist Papers right now for no reason. I've already read them, you know, it, but nice. like it, it, it keeps you, it keeps you curious. It keeps you intellectually stimulated. And that's really important, and that can parlay into every other a avenue of your life. So that's all I want people to take away from, is like, you can do your thing, be a nerd, be a gamer, be in the comics, whatever the case might be, but like, make the time for the stuff that, and I'm not saying this to be derogatory, but make the stuff, you know, make the time for stuff that actually really matters. Get out the comfort and zone. And this is the stuff that really matters. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta fit it in. It, there's, nerd culture is defined in a lot of ways to me by being very one-dimensional. And I've always found that really disappointing. I'm not saying that there aren't people in, in nerd culture that don't know a lot of things that are smarter than me. Of course there are. But I always find that like it's it's it, a lot of it is like one note. And all I wanted people to really walk away from is being like, well, you don't have to be that way. It's not you don't have anything to prove by how many trophies you have. You have nothing to prove about how many comics you've read. You have nothing to prove. Do what you is do what's fun, but make the time for this really this really tangible, important stuff that dictates everything in your life and share that love with other people. So I if people agree. just walk away from Colin's last stand with that, more power to them. Um, if they don't, then I failed. And that's basically it. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, I, I really agree. I think that those are those are ideas that I, that I feel like a lot of people just don't think about. And, and it could really be summed up as just like getting out of your comfort zone. I feel like myself included, a lot of people get really comfortable being immersed in the world of gaming, being immersed in the world of pop culture, entertainment. And stuff and it really gets away from all the other stuff that you had mentioned beforehand uh, like for me one of the ways that you know personally that i can relate how i kind of get out of my element you know from uh gaming and stuff is that i go out and I, I do a lot of fitness stuff like i actually use my nunchucks and i practice with them as opposed to just lifting or doing like traditional exercise that everybody talks about like on social media and stuff i to me i get joy out of just tr me messing around with my nunchucks not only because it makes me feel badass but also because it's just something different that i'm just not used to all the time and i feel like a lot of people maybe need to find that one thing whether it's fit whether it's reading whether it's watching stuff whether it's doing activity even doing something as like simple as like fishing because i know my dad he that's what he does he goes out fishing in various different places that's how he gets his ability to get away from everything else like that so people need to find that one aspect of them that that allows them to be a little bit more complex rather than one dimensional like you said uh, uh, one thing i want to explore a little bit that you've talked about in a couple different podcasts as we start to wind this down. Uh, I want to know a little bit about your your thoughts on on media and and not just games media, but just media in general, because you've spoken a bunch of times about how, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on with the games media, how, how you felt a certain way about them, how whether it's for good or for worse. One of the things that I noticed that I don't think a lot of people talk about is that there's a lot of animosity or a big divide between new new media or people that identify as like content creators influencers etc people that are on youtube streamers and such and people that are being traditional media that aren't necessarily big part of big websites like the ign's like the polygons the kotakas of the world like myself how i could relate uh i'm still 
green. I'm still young in, in this industry doing what I do and such. But I always feel like now, more so these days, there's some sort of animosity or some sort of, not, not really a prejudice. I don't think it's that extreme, but there is an animosity. There is like kind of like an anger or like a sensitivity here uh, between people that, that don't, for whatever reason, just have this like disdain for media, whether it's political, whether it's gaming or whatever else. Uh, so tell me a little bit about there, your thoughts on that. Because again, you've talked about it a couple of times here and there. Yeah, I think that um, I think that there's a ubiquity with with the way media is being treated or the way media treats others in games and politics and all this is because media people don't really trust the media and I, you know speaking specifically about games media I don't know that there's anything untrustworthy about games media I just think that there's like I've always said like I never saw anything untoward happen ever and I were I was a senior editor of the biggest gaming site in the world. Very so true. like when I say like when people are like you, you were bought out you were this I'm like I've never I've never even heard of that I happening. even got that just you know? doing a review like because I I got I had got commissioned at one point for IGN to do a freelance review for a new Naruto game that came out apparently I got told that I got paid off by Bandai Namco to give it a, or some other company to give it a bad grade bad yeah bad it's grade. like a, it's a it, it's it's ridiculous it's like uh, I'm I'm like I'm telling you that stuff at least at IGN that didn't happen I can't speak about other outlets but the um. But I think that there's animosity because I think that a lot of the, you know, it, unless they're not very smart, the people that work at these sites realize that their days are numbered. Like it's, it's, if, if you're working at a Polygon or, a, you know, something like that or a Kotaku and you're not a Jason Schreier or something like that, like someone who really has, you know, uh, gumption and, and, and real ability and like a name for himself and stuff like that, you're done. Like it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's not it's not going to be very much longer now. You know, we're talking about a few years where these things are really going to start collapsing. And, and the reason that is, and the reason that way there's so much animosity with old media towards, you know, what's cool. Well, we used to call it internet new media, but I'm actually referring to them now as old media because the new stuff on YouTube and Twitch and stuff, that's where the, that's where it is. True. And, um, I think one of the major problems with games media, the main mainstream games media is who are they talking to? Who are they speaking to? I go to Polygon. I look at the, who writes a Polygon? Like, who are you talking to that are playing games? Like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know any gamers that, that are reading your stuff. I don't know any gamers that are re that you're resonating with. And I think that if you look at the staff of a, a site like Polygon, do you think that they would be? Do you think they would be able to be successful on Twitch or YouTube? Not a prayer. And so I would not a prayer that they would be successful in, in those in those avenues without that kind of overarching umbrella over them. And so I would be upset and nervous too if I was in that world. But I wouldn't be. So I wouldn't have so much animus towards my audience. I wouldn't have so much animus towards YouTube and Twitch. I try to learn and adapt. And frankly, that's what I see my old site IGN do. Um, they're adapting. They're adapting very smartly because they have smart people at the head with Pear and all those guys that are doing smart things, trying to get involved with you know, Disney or whatever they're doing on Twitch and YouTube um, and have been doing that for a long time. And so I think that there's just a lot of animosity there because I look at, you know, I'm like when I read these things on on Polygon or Rock, Paper, Shotgun or whatever it's about, you know, like this very social justice, far left stuff. I'm like, I don't think you understand who video game players are. I'm not, I'm not even saying it from a political ideological standpoint. I'm like, I just think that you guys, I have no idea where this collection of writers came from and how they think that they speak for a group of a, a, an audience or that they resonate with anyone. No wonder your websites are dying. You, you know what? It's you know? funny and you I, mention I, that. It's funny you mention that because I've read a couple things on uh, on not only just those websites, but even on a couple others where it feels like they're they're saying stuff just to have people pay attention without really saying anything of substance, like not trying to give a lesson or not trying to give food for thought, but just trying to talk loud. That's how I feel like. Yeah. And and it's adversarial. They have an adversarial relationship with their audience, like, and that's that's something that that's weird. Like, you can't have an adversarial relationship with your audience where people are literally clicking on your stuff because they hate you. That's not, that's not a, there's a, a place for that. You know, um, Howard Stern, who I'm a huge fan of, another son of Definitely Long Island, mm -hmm. would, would, would always say that, like, their statistics show that people that hate Howard Stern listen longer and they're therefore more profitable than the people that love Howard Stern. Like, they listen for 10 minutes longer or something like that. And, you know, I'm like, okay, there's, there's certainly a financial benefit to that. But at the end of the day, if your audience doesn't trust you and, they don't, and you don't resonate with your audience and stuff like that, you're doomed. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, like, the, the people that, you know, PewDiePie says some terrible shit and has, you know, obviously made a lot of mistakes and I don't know him personally, but he clearly resonates with his audience, you know, and that clearly makes Polygon mad. And I think that that's, that's obvious to anyone. The thing is, is that they have no control. The, the big thing that I think that you have to walk away with is that they have no control. They try to destroy people. They try to you know ruin people's careers. They did it to me. 
I, I remember you know? that. By and, the way, and, for the record, they, that was some uh, bullshit when that happened. I remember I remember reading that. I remember seeing all that stuff unfold. And, and I think that was just wrong because the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I'm sorry to interrupt, is just that uh, it's okay. it, it, what I find amazing is that there seems to be a little bit of a bandwagon mentality uh, with, with a lot of people that do look at old media or again traditional media uh with with a really condescending eye it's happened to me in the past before it actually happened to me recently within the last month where it's almost like calling me a games journalist or someone that identifies a game journalist or what i do as like my own chosen career like saying it as an insult like saying like oh like he doesn't really matter oh he's not credible or he's not really anything of the sort and they really say that in order to pair me someone like me up with like stuff that what they've seen in instances like that which i think is is really shady all around just overall because that's shitty in of itself, but also shitty on the flip side of that. Like, do you ever notice like that, that bandwagon mentality though? Yeah, I think I see it on both sides. I always, yeah, I always, you know, the games journalist in quotes or whatever, like that kind of thing. Yeah. And I always, you know, I'm like, okay, there, there are, there are people like, like again, Jason Schreier that do amazing work, um, that are, that are legitimate games writers, games journalists. And then there's a lot of hacks that don't do anything. And so it's, 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 and that they're somehow like foisted up by this like cabal basically, <laughs> Of like, like it's like it's just this incestuous nonsense that goes on with a lot of games journalism that I, I understand why people hold that um, at low regard because it's it, it doesn't deserve respect. But no, I think that there's still a place for for quality journalism and there's still a place for differing ideas. And I have no problem with far left or liberal ideas in games. I think that's great. And in fact, I've made videos supporting the inclusion of left politics and games and and all these kinds of things. So like I, I've practiced what I preached, but I understand why people are tired of it. I understand why people don't trust these people. I understand that when you see a video of a guy playing a video game, um, like happened at Games Beat, where he's playing Cuphead and he's terrible, as if he's never held a controller in his entire life, I understand why people might look at that and be like, huh, that's weird, you know? Or when they see footage that was at Polygon of a guy playing Doom as if he's never played a shooter in his life. I remember that. But this is the guy that's, but this is the guy that's covering Doom? And people and people are supposed to just eat that. I, I understand why people are upset and make fun of that stuff because it's embarrassing, you know. And um, the, the the audiences deserve better, and they're finding better. And I think they're finding better on Twitch. They're finding better on YouTube. They're finding better on Patreon. They're finding better with people like Jim Sterling. They're finding better with with all sorts of you know people that are just much more reputable, know more about games, play games more, have a bigger audience, have more clout, all that kind of stuff. And um, it's about adaptation. You were talking about that earlier about adapting even ideas as they are going at, even as they're, they're running their course. And, um, games media is staunchly, um, incapable of understanding what they're doing wrong. And, uh, that's gonna be a problem for them moving forward. It's already a huge problem for them. It was just, what was, what was the, what was the next site that just died escapist? That was the next one. I mean, this is not going to stop. So, um, so I'm not trying to be harsh on these people. I come from that world. And I understand it. I understand it a lot better than I think a lot of people understand it. I think that's and what gives what you say more credence, though. I mean, because you understand that world. You understand both worlds like that. And I, I think that there's not there's not a – there doesn't seem to be as much of an emphasis on knowledge of a, an area or knowledge of a game as there seems to be in, like, making a social point or a social message. And I think everyone's tired of it. and um, Or a lot of people are tired of it. And I think that the results show for themselves. So, um, so yeah, you know, people can support what they want, read what they want. That's all good. I, I wish the best to my old site IGN. I think they're all, you know they're still doing awesome work. There's all there's great people there, um, but if people can't see a lot of games media for what it is at this point, I mean I don't know what else I can possibly say. I mean it's pretty obvious that there's a massive portion of their audience that feels like that no one speaks to them, and maybe that's why bro, going back to your question that people were sad when I left because I spoke to a lot of those people, and it's not it's not a it's not a political thing necessarily. It's not a conservative thing. It's a realistic thing. It's a real life thing. It's that like I don't live in a fantasy world. Where where I'm offended by video games. <laughs> I, I also you know? feel like I also feel like like when you spoke, you know, to tie it all together with everything, that when you spoke to your audience or when you spoke to the audience, I should say, you weren't trying to shove things in their face. And I think that's also a big problem. And I think that for me personally, look on the outside looking in towards everything else, where I feel like a lot of people have a problem with, myself included. Like I never like the idea of having like a certain idea, a certain philosophy, a certain standpoint being shoved into my face. Just present it to me. Just let me see things. Let me understand your point of view. Let me let me understand where you're coming from. But don't try to force it down my throat. And I think that's why a lot of people liked you and liked what you did throughout the years is because you never tried to force anything down people's throats. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I, I've always been confused about the, you know, I, I think that there's some criticism of me that's totally valid. But there's a lot of criticism about, like, how Colin thinks he's always right. And Colin, and I'm like, 
when did I ever tell you that I cared if you accepted what I said? When did I ever say that? I'm just going to say what I say. You can take it or leave it. You can hate me or like me, disagree with me, agree with me. It doesn't matter. But I never, I, I'm just telling you what I'm telling you. But it was never important to me that people accepted it. You know, like, and yeah. I think that that was the, and I think that that was the whole thing. You accept it on your own terms. And if you don't accept it, then maybe I'm not doing my job effectively. And that's on me. So I always, I was always mad when people are like, Colin doesn't change his mind. Colin does that. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's an accurate representation at all of what I did. And, um, I'm glad that it's, a lot of it has still resonated with people. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And, um, you know, I'm not done talking about games in some way. You know, I, I, have been tweeting about them more and, um, next episode of Colin's last stand is going to be about Wolfenstein. I've been playing it. Nice. And, um, specifically because of how it ties into Nazi culture. Um, and I think that that's a good angle for Colin's last stand. So I'm trying to, you know, um, reach back out to that audience that feels uh, disenfranchised or whatever. That's not really the right word, but in a way where they, they just feel like they don't have anyone anymore. And I'm sorry about that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, doing my best to make content that I hope resonates with you in a different way. I, I agree. I think you're doing good. That's fine. I think that sounds very cool. I mean, again, just, it, it, it's very interesting to, to see how all this is going to pan out or at least how things are going to end up being within the next like year or so. Or not. But here's a good way to wrap this up and a good way to kind of culminate everything. And it's something that I ask everybody that comes onto the show, because I always feel like this is the one thing that I feel like they could give to the audience, you know, outside of everything else we've talked about at this point, what is the one thing, that you feel like you could tell somebody, you know, piece of advice, something that you feel like people need to know about that they could get or at least could take with them out of this episode where if they want to get into the industry or any other industry like that or just online culture, what is the one thing you feel like you could give to them right now? I mean, I probably can give them a lot of advice, but I mean, I think the major thing is something we used to say all the time, which is if, if, you, if you choose a path and you want to do something, then just be consistent and do it. Um, you're never – you might not succeed – at what you do, maybe you make a new podcast, maybe you're making a YouTube series, whatever. You might not succeed. Actually, chances are you won't succeed. I mean, because there's just so much saturation and it's just math, right? Um, but if you're not consistent in delivering, if you're not doing it anyway, um, you know, you know, I'm not saying you should do a show that no one listens to for four years. But what I'm saying is, if you don't deliver a show on Wednesday when you promise a show is going to be on Wednesday, if you're not doing things on Wednesdays when you promised that things are going to be done on Wednesdays, then you'll never know if you're not succeeding because of the content or you're not succeeding because people can't rely on you. And so my, my major thing with this is just like, if you're going to do something, just do it, do it consistently hit on a one day hit every other Wednesday, whatever the case might be. So consistency, it's everything. It really is. It's everything. People rely on you, um, to do the content when you say you're going to do it. I agree. Make like Nike and just do it <laughs> practically. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Make like Nike. So Colin, thank you immensely. This was an awesome episode to do. Finally, again, this is one of like one of the one of the reasons why I did this whole show was to do an episode like this. And I feel like, you know, this is something that's cool that I was able to finally make happen. And thanks to you that, you know, we were able to make it happen for everybody out there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it with you. Thank you for your years of support. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone listening and uh, hope you enjoyed. Um, I'm always on Twitter if you need me. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so tell everybody where you're at. Again, you're always on Twitter. You're on Patreon. You're also on YouTube with the with, uh, Collins Last Stand on the YouTube channel. Tell everybody where they could find you. Yeah, so Twitter at No Taxation, if you want to follow me there. Um, YouTube.com slash Collins Last Stand. Um, and if you like that, you can go to Patreon and support me, but that's not necessary. Um, and uh, my content's all ad-free, no ads. Um, totally independent. Turned down many opportunities to make that reality. Um, and um, so, you know, not going to waste your time with all that kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, No Taxation Twitter. YouTube.com slash Collins Last Stand. And, um, you know, I'm on Facebook and Reddit and all that kind of stuff too. But you'll, you'll find me. I'm around, but Twitter is where I announce everything. So, so that's the best place to see me. You're always lurking. You're always around. You're always putting something out there, which is great. But there'll be Indeed. links. To, there'll be links to all that stuff, guys, down below in the description box. So you guys can go directly to all of his links there. Follow him on Twitter. Check him out on YouTube. Check out his Patreon. Check out all that stuff. Again, Colin, thank you. This is this is a highlight for me. I'm giddy. This is great. I can't wait to to check out more of the stuff that you post up. I can't wait to check out your new videos and stuff. Any besides the Wolfenstein stuff, any other things that you're planning that you could let them know about? Yeah, um, let's see. I uh, Next week's videos will be Wolfenstein, and I'm doing one uh, that the patrons voted on, which is what the founders would think of the 21st century. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm reading the Federalist Papers, to try to get some information about that I can kind of glean from the 18th century. Nice. Um, so I'm doing that. Uh, I'm getting an early copy of uh, Call of Duty World War II to do a video on that. Um, so that will be fun. And uh, yeah, I mean, otherwise, I'm, I'm kind of just going as I go. There's a new election. I do elections every every month on Patreon for people to decide what topic I should cover the next month. 
Um, so there's some good ones in there. So that will the, the results of those elections in the coming days will dictate what I'm doing um, after next week. So, so yeah, people can look forward to more of that, uh, more of that game content. Oh, and I'm doing Fireside Chats, which is a new podcast. Yes, um, which is fun. So you can subscribe to that on iTunes or whatever if you want to. And it's that's that's just ancillary Collins Last Stand stuff where I interview people about anything. Um, so similar to the idea I had when I came up with the idea of Game Over Greggy Show. Um, I loved that idea and wanted to pursue that because I like talk. I, I have an interest in a lot of different things. And so this is kind of the spiritual successor to that as it were. Awesome. Yeah. I've listened to all the episodes thus far and I love them. Uh, again, I love the one with Miss Movies. I love the one with Jeff Kanata. I think that was pretty cool. Again, a lot of good stuff on there that you guys will be linked in the description box below so you guys can check it out. But again, thank you, Colin, for being on the show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to leave a like on this video. Subscribe to the channel for all our videos related to gaming and a whole bunch of other cool stuff we got on here. I'll have more episodes of TK Spotlight coming very, very soon. Let me know what's up in the comment section below. Any uh, suggestions for guests or any other topics you guys want us to cover. Why not? And we will talk to all of you again very soon. Peace out and stay epic, everybody.